Good afternoon, everybody. We are back. And uh, I would like to welcome Mike Berge, who's the CEO of uh, Berge Wind Power in the United States. And uh, Mike, you'll talk about lowering the cost of small wind for homes and farms. We look really forward to your presentation. Please go ahead. Hello, Mike. Are you there? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Did you hear what I said? I did, yes. Oh, that's good. Well, yes. please perform. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, and thank you for the, all the arrangements to uh, put on working very well. Um, Let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, don't want that. So can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can. So I'm actually going to uh, cover a lot of ground today. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, our new the development of our new uh, wind turbine, uh, uh, 15 kilowatt turbine. I want to briefly mention some current uh, research projects here that you might find of, of interest. And then I'd like to spend uh, probably half of the presentation talking about um, some recent uh, work here in the U.S. to improve the uh, small wind certification standard, something I think is uh, uh, very important to uh, to the industry. So. Um, first of all, for those of you who may not be familiar with Berge Wind Power, and we don't have a, a, a large uh, footprint in, in Europe, we're quite active uh, other places around the world, particularly in the U.S., but not so much in Europe. Um, we were established in 1977 and shipped our first turbine in 1980. Um, we have made turbines from one kilowatt to 15, but now we're really focusing on just our 10 and our 15 kilowatts both for on-grid and off-grid use. We've supplied a little over 10,000 uh, systems. They're installed in all 50 US states and over 100 countries around the world. Uh, we started with a focus on simplicity of design, reducing the number of moving parts, uh, reducing maintenance burden, and that sort of thing. And that served our, us quite well. Um, we have some turbines that have now been in operation for over 35 years, and some of them have demonstrated 20 plus years with 100% availability and zero O&M costs. Certainly not all of them, uh, but um, uh, it, uh, we found that simplicity of design uh, pays big benefit, benefits in, in small wind. Um, so we've had some problems in the industry lately. A lot of companies have gone out of business or had to change ownership, get refinanced. And certainly um, the loss of, of uh, national subsidy programs in the UK, uh, Italy, Japan have had a, a, a big effect, but really the existential threat to our industry is the declining cost of, of solar. And I can complain all day long about the $40 billion that China put into uh, subsidizing mega factories, but at the end of the day, we still have to compete with, with solar. Um, and so this slide shows that um, this is for uh, levelized cost of energy is the metric that you use to determine um, how you compete with other energy generation or storage technologies. And uh, you can see here our best selling 10 kilowatt turbine um, it was the best selling turbine of its size in the world. Uh, just can't compete with rooftop solar and people are either in our markets in homes and farms are either going to buy solar or wind hybrids make sense but people choose one or the other uh, in the real world and so you can see at um, at 21 cents per kilowatt hour um, using you know sort of standard assumptions uh, we just can't compete and of course when you combine in the uh, ease with which solar can be installed uh, lower permitting um, uh, more subsidies for solar in most places uh, damn tough to compete. So we recognized that um, uh, six, seven years ago and started an effort to reduce our costs uh, so we could survive. Um, and so 
we looked at all the things we could do with our existing platform, a furling turbine with pultruded blades, uh, had served us very well over decades. Um, but we could, while we could improve our competitiveness against other small turbines, we could not meaningfully uh, improve our competitiveness against solar. And so we had to start with a clean sheet of paper. And so the XL15 is our our uh, new entrance and uh, has uh, is very, very different from the configuration that we've used in the past. And I, we wanna, I wanna acknowledge the support we received from the US Department of Energy and the National Renewable Energy Lab, which allowed us to take risks. It's cost shared. We had to put a lot of money in ourselves, but it allowed us to take risks we wouldn't have otherwise been able to afford. So the new turbine uh, is, uh, uh, 9.6 meters in diameter. Uh, it has tailored uh, aerodynamics. That's really the secret sauce that allows us to make the big gains. It's it's the same recipe that the large turbine manufacturers use, but it's a lot of a lot of um, R and D work. The blades are are carbon fiber and glass composites. Uh, we had to develop new ways to make them uh, affordably. Uh, it's a variable speed machine with stall control. Doesn't furl. There are only two moving parts, uh, and it's designed for no maintenance, scheduled maintenance at all, five-year inspection interval. And based upon the fact that our older designs have been running 35 years, we're fairly confident that uh, we can now project a 30 to 75-year uh, operating life. We're matching that with an advanced silicon carbide um, uh, high-frequency switching uh, inverter and an eight-kilowatt uh, dump load. The um, the change over the existing product, the 10 kilowatt, are, are shown here in this in this chart. Um, you know, even though we've just got 37 percent more rotor area, you'll note we're making 139 percent uh, more energy at a reference uh, six meter per second um, wind speed, which is typically where we find you you need to have a six meter per second at the top of the tower or more to really be competitive. That's where our customers. Uh, uh, typically have for a resource. Um, the retail cost is up 18%. This is the cost of the machine and the inverter. And of course, we offer uh, discounts for dealers. Um, that's This is the customer's end price. And the total CapEx installed on a, on a 30 meter self-supporting lattice tower, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, is actually down 17%. And there's a story behind that uh, having to do with the foundations. And so when you add it all together, we're able to reduce with the new turbine, the uh, levelized cost of energy by 64%. And so we flipped the script and now uh, we're cheaper than solar and enough cheaper that people uh, will go through the extra effort to get the permits to go to taller towers uh, and, um, and can do so with, with fewer subsidies than is typically available for solar. So, it's put us back into the competitive game. And uh, although it's not fun competing with the government of China, um, it can be done uh, with good engineering. And the support from uh, 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 national governments in terms of supporting R&D. So let me talk about the, um, the towers. Uh, we do like tall towers. We, we offer, the minimum we like to see is, is 18 meters and we, have the average tower height that we installed last year was uh, 37 meters, but uh, we'd like to standardize on the 30 meter self-supporting lattice. It has a small footprint uh, compared to guide towers. Uh, people like that. But the problem has been the uh, concrete foundations. You 30 to 40 cubic yards of concrete, um, three days of construction. None of our dealers ever enjoyed the concrete work uh, and it's quite expensive. So we've developed a, um, a power installed screw anchor system um, you can, that can, can go in with um, a, a skid steer mounted uh, torque motor. Uh, you can install these anchors in, in about three hours. Uh, and um, uh, we've done as part of this and, and saved quite a bit of money, uh, I should say. Uh, not only is it quicker, but it's a, a, about 75% uh, uh, lower in cost. Uh, and we've done uh, the picture in the lower right. Uh, we've done extensive field testing with, um, I think those anchors have uh, 96 uh, strain gauges and 14 accelerometers. 
Um, so we, we know the loads quite well, and uh, we're very confident in fielding this and have, have developed an application guide for it. One of the um, uh, things that we, I didn't show in the other chart was this turbine has the same thrust load as our 10 kilowatt, even though it's got uh, over double the energy production. And we're finding that this is uh, finding a, a strong market in retrofits for non-operational turbines. So we're replacing Jacobs wind turbines, Gaia's, Proven's, um, a number of, um, of, of machines with very good towers, but not so good machines. Um, now, is a big machine and it produces more energy than most homes use, particularly um, in Europe. Uh, we use more energy in homes, of course, here in the US. But we think it's, it's size for the future because we're moving away from using fossil fuels for heating. Uh, and, and when you, when, when you uh, substitute electricity, you need a lot more electricity. Uh, and so this turbine uh, can, can support the uh, uh, a transition to, to um, uh, uh, clean heat and also for electric transportation. So we think the, the sizing, although it's bigger than our existing uh, 10 kilowatt, uh, the, the energy production is sized for the market. And of course, when we're talking about heat, uh, we do a, a better job than solar because solar is, is not so strong in the winter and particularly not very strong at night when it's the coldest. So um, we're, we, uh, we can see some advantage there. And as we look out into the future, um, we're very uh, much interested in the progress that's being made in power electronics and the lower cost of storage. And we see a tremendous opportunity to flip the script in the utilities being against us all the time. And we've got four decades of experience with that. But if we can start delivering peak shaving and, and resiliency benefits using the new power electronics, we think we can have the support of utilities. And, and so we're working that way, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we're also seeing uh, quite a bit of increased interest from customers on, on um, concerns about reliability of the grid. So climate change is producing longer and more severe power outages. People are, are more concerned about power reliability. Uh, 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 elect, electric power is becoming more and more uh, integral to quality of life. And so we believe that resiliency or providing power surety uh, is a killer app for distributed energy resources. Um, and that means small microgrids. Uh, and that is something that's very similar to village and telecom remote power, which we've been doing for 35 years. So we're quite comfortable in that wheelhouse and uh, we see a lot of opportunity and we're actively working there. Um, we have a, uh, active and significant program at Berge Wind Power to develop a uh, home microgrid system. And this is aimed at being a standardized and affordable, and that's key, affordable um, system that can provide both long-term resiliency to the homeowner and um, peak shaving and voltage support and other grid enhancement uh, values to the utilities. And therefore, the utilities would be interested in helping to finance and install these in a, an, a, an array of that would be a virtual uh, generator system. One of the interesting aspects of this is we're using uh, Second Life EV battery packs. We're working with Nissan uh, Motors um, using the Leaf uh, battery packs. There's 400,000 of those out in the field. And uh, when they get down to about 70% range, they they change them out. Well, there's still 70% left. And, and we can get those at, at very affordable prices. So this is this shows some of the some of the equipment that we're using and um, sort of renderings of what that stuff looks like. We're we're months away from fielding the the first system on this, and um, we are working with a, a major U.S. utility on um, on um, uh, evaluate doing the due diligence for for uh, pilot projects. And then we're doing something very interesting. Uh, I don't know that we'll sell a lot of these, but we're going to build one and have a lot of fun doing so. Um, again, thanks to the Department of Energy for supporting our work on this. But this is a, a, a portable microgrid system with two 15 kilowatt turbines on tilt-up uh, uh, monopole towers. Uh, it compacts down to a 40-foot 
container envelope can be moved around. And um, we, we are working with the, one of our partners on the project is Cummins Power Systems that builds all of the generators for the US military. Uh, and that green box that you see is a, 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 a standard 30 kilowatt uh, a military grade diesel generator, which we'll be uh, interfacing with. So this, is, this one's gonna be a lot of fun. People have called it a jack in the box and uh, turbine in a box and that sort of thing. But uh, we're, we're looking forward to building, building that. That will happen this summer. So with that, let me switch over uh, to a different hat. I'm also president of our trade association, the Distributed Wind Energy Association in the US. This is, a, uh, we have about 40 members. We have a, a lobbyist in Washington. We primarily focus on federal policy uh, in Washington on incentives and, um, and funding for the US Department of Energy. Um, and uh, we have a, a annual conference and a, a lobby day. And last year at the annual conference, we did a half day review of the certification and pretty much identified that it was a barrier to innovation. And in these difficult times uh, for our industry, uh, that's, a, that's a problem. And so, um, and particularly the duration test and the treatment of micro turbines were identified. And so we decided we were gonna do, try and do something about that. Um, this year in February, we convened an expert group, that's the top photo there, uh, of people with 10, 15 years of, of certification experience, uh, and we, um, we uh, applied, you know, there have now been uh, 10 years of experience with actual certification requirements, so um, we, we discussed all of that, what we could do to um, make it easier and cheaper to to certify turbines without losing the value to consumers. Um, we created a, a draft. We took that to our industry, to our annual meeting and convened a half day meeting uh, review of our industry. The picture in the bottom shows that, but it's later in the day when a few people have uh, sort of uh, uh, gone, gone home already. Um, but um, we had uh, 38 people at that meeting and um, we uh, produced out of that a, um, a, a final draft that will go in for, for the, the um, uh, approval through the process I'll talk about. So I just wanted to go through some of the proposed changes and maybe in, during the discussion time, we can talk about this further, but I'll just go through it quickly. Uh, we're raising and redefining the scope of the standard to 150 kW at peak power. Um, which is the top of the uh, field tested power curve. Um, we're setting different uh, requirements for different size turbines, and you'll see that in the, in the last slide. Um, we're changing the basis of the reference annual uh, uh, wind speed, uh, excuse me, uh, annual uh, energy rating from an average, assumed average of five meters per second to six meters per second. We're specifically doing that because Five meters per second is a very conservative and photovoltaics are not rated at conservatively. They're rated uh, at a thousand watts per square meter, which is, uh, so this is trying to make us uh, level the playing field a little bit. Um, we added micro turbines to the definition and uh, defined them as a peak power output of, of up to one kilowatt and we reduced the certification requirements as I'll describe. We clarified some aspects of power performance testing primarily to make it, um, to, for example, to not toss out uh, sectors uh, where the wind turbine performance might be diminished, but the anemometer would not be sh uh, sheltered, which shadowed, which is, is something that doesn't make much, is now you have to throw that data out, and doesn't make much sense. So we got, we're getting rid of that or proposing to. Um, we've um, moved the determination of peak power to the safety and function section. Um, we uh, refined some of the acoustic testing um, uh, requirements and uh, gotten rid of the uncertainty analysis, um, which we felt didn't have a very high value. Um, we've streamlined the data gathering and safety and function. In strength and safety, we've shrunk the number of IEC classes allowed uh, to two. Uh, uh, class two, which most turbines have been certified under, and very few have been certified under class one. Uh, and class S, we think, can cover, which, which allows the uh, company to define the class um, in coordination with their certification body, 
uh, we think that those two will cover it. Uh, we've we've um, loosened some of the material safety factors, which uh, are allowed more discretion of the certifying body because the um, those material safety factors have driven up the weight and, and expense of the turbines more than we think that uh, is necessary. Um, we modified uh, turbulence intensity um, and uh, recommended uh, limitation of the simple loads modeling uh, to turbines um, uh, of 10 kilowatts or less, uh, requiring a Campbell diagram for system frequencies and uh, adding some requirements on air elastic modeling. Biggest change probably in terms of impact on the cost and time for certification is the duration test. So we've eliminated the six month operating period and the 90% operational time fraction. Um, we've reduced the number of hours um, to a thousand operating hours and the 15 meter per second higher uh, average wind speed requirements to, to 10 hours, uh, currently 25. And uh, we've, we've uh, uh, corrected what was a, a original mistake of, of not specifying the, the averaging time on duration tests to one minute as it was in the power performance, which has made manufacturers use 10 minute averaging, uh, which is which creates quite a bit more burden. Um, but to balance the, uh, the duration test um, uh, reductions, we're adding uh, a, to the conformity assessment a factory production control, which some other countries had, but the U.S. did not, uh, and a, most importantly, a post-certification surveillance program of five turbines for three years. And so what we're essentially saying is we'll actually learn more about the reliability uh, and durability of a turbine over a three-year period than we would have over that six months. And so um, there are required inspections uh, so that surveillance program we think has more value than the original duration test. Um, and then uh, some minor things we, we uh, uh, these are, are not particularly important. Um, two things, um, the micro turbine requirements, um, it costs, so this you may be aware, this is the, um, the, the uh, was, was the Southwest Wind Power Air, uh, 403 turbines now built by Primus, but it costs almost $200,000 to certify a 400 watt wind turbine, which is kind of silly. So we're, we're now proposing that if you've got a micro turbine under one kilowatt peak power, you have to do power performance, you have to do safety and function, you have to do our duration test, but you don't have to do acoustics, you don't have to do any strength and design analysis, and you don't have to do a blade test. So um, we think that that's, that's proportional to the safety risk and will make it a lot easier for those micro turbines to get certified, which of course it helps everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Yeah. It has been really interesting. We are unfortunately a bit short in time to keep the schedule and I hope if you okay. had some more that we can take it uh, later on when we have the free talk. That's fine. Is that fine? Thank you very much. Very interesting. And it's really good news for the whole business. So thank you. We have now the uh, networking program. And uh, uh, we have been quite busy today. And therefore, uh, not everybody really fulfilled their, um, their presentations. We, we have really tried to, to keep, uh, uh, keep the schedule. <coughs> Uh, some some of the uh, speakers had to leave and so on and was pressed by their own schedule. So that's why, and I hope you have understanding for that. Uh, Mike Berge is, um, uh, didn't have the chance to fulfill his presentation. So Mike, if you're on, uh, it'll be delighted if you will um, go on again and uh, then afterward we'll have some questions for you. And then it will be Rune Eilers, who also had, uh, uh, didn't have the chance to fulfill at all. And I think uh, Fritz Ock was the same. Uh, there was no questions for me uh, when I talked about the microwind. So if there are anything that uh, questions there, it will also be possible. Otherwise, I think that uh, when we have finished these uh, items, uh, I'm sure the discussion will 
go on. So, uh, Mike, will you go on again? Sure. Uh, and I, Thank you. my apologies for running over, and um, I do appreciate the uh, time to. Let me see if I can get the. Um, so, I need to pull this back up and give it the full screen. Okay, so I just had two uh, slides uh, left. Um, this is the um, table that, that lays out how we uh, propose to change the requirements uh, for certification based upon the size of the turbine, again, based upon peak power from uh, zero on up to 150 kW. And essentially, um, it says that as you get larger, uh, we're not recommending that you use the simplified loads model um, uh, uh, or and that as you get larger, you have to do a little more verification of the aerolastic modeling. Um, since the uh, first versions of the standards were put into practice a decade ago, uh, the aerolastic modeling has come a long, long way. And, and so there was a general consensus that that most uh, manufacturers, OEMs, will, will be using the modeling. And so we're, we're trying to make sure that, that uh, proper levels of verification appropriate to the, the scale of the turbine and therefore the CapEx uh, and the uh, investment in, in, in certification are, are appropriate. Um, one of the things that, that has changed is that we, we want the turbines above 50 kilowatts to go through the same duration test as the smaller turbines. That has generally not been the case in the past, but we think that now that we've, we've shortened the uh, duration test period and have the, the um, uh, surveillance period for three years afterwards, that it's appropriate and not too much of a burden for the larger turbines, to, larger small turbines to, uh, to do the duration test. Uh, and then I'll just, uh, on this slide, uh, the last thing would be uh, to note that we've reduced the requirements for micro wind in hopes that uh, we'll have more uh, certified micro turbines. And, and my final slide is just the next steps. Um, so what we have now is a industry recommendation for um, a, a, a very uh, uh, updated standard, but it has to go through a very formal uh, accredited process of approval, a consensus standards pro process, the same uh, worldwide. Uh, here in the U.S., it's the American National Standards Institute. AWEA, American Wind Energy Association, has an ongoing program of that. Uh, I've been active in it for years, and, and uh, uh, Brent Somerville, who will, is the chair of the Small Turbine Committee uh, within the AWEA Standards Program, has been active in it for years, and that's the, the process that we'll use. Uh, that will be led by uh, Brent Somerville, uh, who is the technical director at ICC Small Wind uh, Certification Council, uh, Jerome Van Dam of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and myself. We hope to have a, a U.S. national standard in place by the end of this year. A lot of things have to go right for that to happen. Standards don't always uh, go as quickly as, as you might like. So, uh, but that's our goal. Um, and then, um, if it follows uh, what happened with the last time uh, the U.S. did a national standard based upon the IEC standard, um, uh, if it's attractive, um, then we hope for voluntary adoption in other countries, and then ultimately, as happened in the past, um, to have it influence the next update of IEC 61400-2, uh, which is uh, been um, idled and, and can't be revisited until 2022. So anyway, that's our program. That's what Brilliant Power is up to. And again, I, uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to finish out my, uh, my presentation and I apologize for running long. Thank you, Morton. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. I will just tell you that actually uh, people outside uh, US should actually envy you uh, especially here in, uh, in Europe, because it's not as simple here as it is in your place. So I think that everybody can learn from what you are doing now. Congratulations about that matter. 
And uh, I hope that also tomorrow that you will uh, continue uh, being within the, the seminar or the, the conference. But um, from here to go, uh, are there any comments or questions for Mike Berge? Yes, Sven Enevoldsen. Yes, hello, Mike. It's good to hello. see you again. Um, good to see you. <clears throat> some years ago, Peggy and I did a study sponsored by the uh, Danish government uh, on small wind market situation. And one of the conclusions that we made in it was that the biggest hindrance for selling small wind was all the crap that was out there. In other words, the, the non-certified turbines. Right. And one of the main um, things that we still see is that we have a lot of uh, governments that are subsidizing and uh, sponsoring uh, the sale of uh, small wind, but not requiring certification. So uh, is there any uh, initiative in uh, spreading the word that certification is required to uh, get a subsidy? Yeah, that's a very good point. And, um, you know, uh, the feed-in tariff programs and, and the um, uh, tax credit here in the U.S. have been tied to certification requirements. So, um, you know, the subsidies, um, the, 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 the government officials offering the subsidies uh, clearly see the value of some sort of quality assurance for the taxpayer or citizen's uh, incentive money. And so um, they're very open to, in fact, enthusiastic about having a certification requirement. Um, so, you know, we fully support that. Uh, right now, uh, DeWea is involved in trying to get the tax credits in the U.S. extended for another five years, and we're uh, working with the IRS to make sure that the language would include um, something that would reference the latest version of, this, of the standards. But uh, I think, I think, um, I, the bigger problem is is places where there are no um, in government incentives, and so there's no leverage on the on the marketplace, and then it's just a buyer's beware. And you know, there's there are new bozos and shysters every week. I mean, Robert Preuss at NREL, and probably you guys at the Folk Center, you see them. I mean, they just come out of the woodwork, and it's and it's unfortunately very easy to raise investor money for things that those of us who've been around know will never work. And, and you see claims of, of the highest uh, CCP that I've ever seen claimed is 280,000%, which was hard to, hard to prove. But investors don't know that. And so I, I don't know how we ever, until there are more machines out and the consumers are wiser, I don't know how we can ever expect that to completely go away. But the standards have definitely helped reduce it. I have a question too. Yes, Peggy, you're on the list, please. Oh, thank you. It's because I can't find my hand anymore. Uh, Mike, you said that the uh, that it would be in 22 that the, uh, that the new IEC would be updated. I've been checking the stability date runs out next year. Oh, is it 21, not 22? Okay, thanks for that correction. So we are in urgent. <laughs> yeah. You know, if there's not a, a, a lot of um, incentive programs, feed-in tariffs and tax credits and other subsidy programs, there's not as much uh, interest in perfecting the standards. We have a, an interest here in the U.S. because we have an incentive program and we want to have more products uh, on the market. So we want to make it easier to get uh, certification. Yes, uh, but one thing is a design standard and the design standard needs to be uh, updated. Otherwise, IEC redraw it. And that's kind of part of my speech for tomorrow, but I think it's very relevant to take it in now. Uh, so we need we need actually engineers to work on the standard the technical design standard 
even with or without certification. Because you can, if you don't certify according to a standard, then, uh, then you're really in problem. And uh, it's, uh, it's, you need, we need someone and it's only Tony who is there uh, uh, at the moment and, uh, and uh, Ignacio who can raise a hand at the uh, TC88 meetings and say that, uh, please, we want to keep stability date a bit longer. Because stability date means that uh, you start working on the standard before yeah. the stability date ex expire. We need to points. keep it. We need to keep it. And we need, to, at least we have something. I know it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. And that's the well, reason that I got it on stability would, date already. I would, get, it, I would yeah. get into an academic argument with you over that. It's, it's, it's not... The, okay. <laughs> the, the the standard should should have a value. If it if it, it if it doesn't have a value, if it can't be used, it shouldn't be there. And 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 trying to keep it there. But okay, we do need it. We know that it would be very nice if all of the national standards were the same. And they're most likely going to draw upon the IEC standard as their basis. So we we do need to to uh, continue perfecting it. I agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Sven Wien from Sweden wants to come with a comment or a question. Yes. Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, thank hi, you Sven. for the presentation. Um, Good to see you. It's uh, impressive uh, to see how how uh, uh, you are renewing uh, your products and and your business. Um, so I I really like much of what you said, but. Um, uh, there was one thing that caught my attention, although it's it's a a detail. I think it's a a detail where where I see a lot of problems. Uh, you mentioned um, changing the definition of um, reference annual energy from five to six meters per second. Correct. And um, sorry, but it's a really bad idea. Uh, it will cause a lot of confusion. And we're talking about the need to harmonize standards. Five meters per second is one of the few harmonized numbers we have in the world. And now you want to change it. And it will open up for also overselling turbines. As we talked about, not, not all manufacturers are serious. If you come from a serious manufacturer, you, you must realize that I've worked at places where people say, we're going to read the standard like the devil reads the Bible. So I think you're opening up to confusion, overselling of turbines, etc. And this is not a good idea when we have agreed internationally on five meters per second. So that's my comment. Uh, sorry, but it was a, such a great presentation, no, but I had to say there's, this. There's no correct answer here. Um, there is only opinions. Our opinion is that, and it's not just my opinion, it was the opinion of the industry in the US um, because we had a number of meetings, uh, is that photovoltaics are not conservatively rated. And if we are conservatively rated in this very competitive environment that we're in, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And so the question is, why do you do that? And if you can easily fix it, fix it. We publish AEO, annual energy output charts and uh, t tables, so, and, and, and just about every sale of a wind turbine includes a prediction based upon wind maps and a, and a method of bins uh, cross plot calculation. So this is just um, a, a, a apples to apples uh, comparison point um, that has value. Uh, and by making it more consistent with the way our primary tech clean technology competition, photovoltaics, does their rating, we help ourselves. That's the view. I, I don't, you know, I, yes, change, nobody likes change, but maybe sometimes change is necessary. Well, how about if I, if I talk to country X and they see a point of, of raising uh, the definition to seven meters per second, then all their turbines will look better than the US. And then country Y could raise it to eight. And then you've caused a, 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 you know, inflation in, in the reference annual energy numbers. Uh, 
sorry, I, I don't think we should just try to make wind look better because this is only about looking better. Uh, we should work on real improvements. And I don't buy that argument that to compete with solar, we have to, to inflate well, our numbers. Well, we'll, it's, uh, we'll it's, just have to agree to disagree on that, Sven. Um, yes. The what we find in 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 our markets is that you're not selling very many wind turbines where the wind resources at the turbine at the top of the tower is five meters per second because solar has a definite cost advantage uh, in that situation. And six meters per second is a more now a more realistic uh, uh, typical wind speed uh, for where actual sales are done. But I I, I totally uh, respect that that. Um, you have a different opinion, and that's uh, uh, that's just the way it is sometimes. <laughs> All right. Good luck with a new turbine, anyway. It looks very Thank interesting. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes. Are there other comments or questions for Mike Berge? Otherwise, uh, we can continue that later on.